Hevra, excuse me, but we would like to get started and take advantage of the short amount of time that we have. I want to welcome everyone to this initial opportunity to learn with our scholar, Dr. Laura Shaw Frank. It's so nice. We all look forward to this wonderful weekend every year. And here it is. And we are honored to have a very, very special person teaching us during the course of the weekend. As we all know, our world has changed dramatically since October 7th. And the more I learn, the more we learn together about the qualifications that Dr. Laura has earned, we are so very privileged to have her guide us through an attempt to characterize our lives post-October 7th. How do we make sense of it? There are so many different aspects that we're all struggling with, and we are so fortunate to have Dr. Laura with us during the course of this weekend. There are so many different stories I've already touched on with her in just uh, five minutes sitting next to her at lunch. Perhaps we'll have the opportunity to explore that a little bit more over the course of the weekend. But for right now, I want you all to please know that Dr. Laura is AJC's William Pechik Contemporary Jewish Life Department. She's the director of that department of American Jewish Committee, which is one of our outstanding, absolutely outstanding organizations guiding our Jewish community and certainly taking center stage now post October 7th. <clears throat> she oversees AJC's Jewish education initiatives as well as Jewish communal research and programming for AJC. Additionally, she oversees AJC's engagement with university administrators in addressing anti-Semitism. So that's enough, I think, already to keep more than a full-time person very, very busy. Dr. Laura has a PhD in Jewish history from the University of Maryland. That's where Jordana graduated from. <laughs> and, and some Kurtzman that are, have connections there. <laughs> Uh, she received her undergraduate and law degree from Columbia University. Prior to HHC's educational and administrative roles, she was at SAR High School and Yeshiva, Yeshivat Maharat, as well as Beit Fila in Baltimore, Maryland. So Dr. Laura, thank you for making the time to be with us. We're all very excited to spend the weekend with you. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here. I was in Dallas, in Texas at all, for the first time in May. And I kind of fell in love with Dallas. I came and I came to visit the AJC region here and to do some talks for the AJC region and just found the most, not only warm and welcoming community, but a community that was so sophisticated, so eager to learn, so connected to Israel and to the Jewish people. And I thought this is really a model Jewish community for the world to look at. So you should know that. I go to a lot of Jewish communities. I don't say that about all of them, but uh, there was something about Dallas that just captured my heart so much. And um, I'm just thrilled to be here for this sweet scholar in residence weekend. I've met the sweet family now and um, what wonderful people and what a wonderful, wonderful thing to do in your father and your husband's memory to create an opportunity for people to learn, for people to grow as Jews. And we're gonna talk more about that tonight. Um, <clears throat> this afternoon, I wanna give you a little taste of what we're gonna read in tomorrow's Torah reading, um, which we're going to, we're gonna be reading a little bit about Miriam tomorrow. But really it's almost a, an, a happy coincidence that it happens to be that we are reading about Miriam tomorrow because I would have wanted to talk about Miriam anyway. I always want to talk about Miriam. You probably, many of you probably haven't given too much thought to who Miriam is in the Torah, but I'd like to open up your mind to a character that has an enormous amount to teach us um, about how to bring about change in the world, how to think about change, how to bring about change. And certainly in this moment, we all need to think about how to bring about change in the world. 
So I'm going to dive in. There are source sheets on your table, which you can take a look at. The sources, I've given you the sources in Hebrew and in English, but we're only going to look at the English. Don't worry. Um, and I hope that by the end, you will be as in love with Miriam as I am. So um, I'll probably, oh, I don't know if this will work for the people on Zoom. I, so, I like to get answers from people in the, con in the, in the audience. So maybe we'll, uh, you'll say your answers. And if we hear, we have answers on Zoom, maybe you'll just let me know. And um, I'll also repeat everybody's answer so that with the microphone so that the people on Zoom can hear. Okay, so um, I've titled this talk, Miriam the Changemaker, How One Little Girl Saved the Whole Jewish People. And you may not think that. You may think, who saved the Jewish people? Who? Moses, right? Of course it was Moses. Well, what you're gonna see today is that there would never have been a Moses without Miriam. And what you're going to see today is that certain ways that Miriam behaved, certain ways that she engaged in change making, were actually profoundly creative and disruptive in the best ways and have much to teach us. Okay, so um, I don't know if you can see, actually, it didn't come out so much in the photocopy. All right, I made the, I thought I made the, the biblical text gray and the rabbinic text white, but it didn't come out that way, but that's okay. Um, before I start, I just want to say one thing about biblical texts and rabbinical texts. Um, biblical texts are, of course, from the Bible. So what are rabbinic texts? You probably know some of this already. You probably learned this from your rabbis. But rabbinic texts are all kinds of texts that the rabbis wrote to expound upon the Bible. So we have stories that we're going to use today from the Talmud. I'm sure you're all familiar with. We also have stories today that we're going to hear from Rashi. So Rashi is a famous, famous medieval commentator who lived in the 11th century in France or in the Franco-German region. Um, and he's a very, very prolific commentator who commentated on the whole Bible and on the Talmud as well. And so we're going to look at those, those figures as well. And I want to say a little something about how we read. Them. So the rabbis are going to tell us stories that don't appear in the Bible. So a lot of times people say to me, so did the stories happen? Do the rabbinical stories happen? So the answer I can tell you is, I mean, depending on who you ask, the stories in the Bible didn't even happen. So, I, you know, it's a hard question to answer. But I do want to say something about that will help you understand the rabbinic texts I'm looking at. <clears throat> the, whether the stories that the rabbis tell about Miriam happened or didn't happen doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we're not reading those stories for the factual content that they impart. What we are reading them for is for the ideas that they impart. The rabbis are telling those stories for a reason. They are giving us those stories to teach us big lessons. So it's not the truth, it's the truth that we're gonna try to get from those rabbinic sources. Okay, here we go, let's dive in. So we're gonna start with source one, which is not from this week's portion. It's actually from the portion that we read a few weeks ago, the portion of Shemot, the first portion in the book of Exodus. Okay, I'm going to read and I'm going to emphasize certain things as I'm reading, and I want you to think about what questions you might have about this text, okay? Here we go. A certain member of the house of Levi went and took for a wife a woman of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw how beautiful he was, she hid him for three months. We know who this is, right? This is Moses. When she could hide him no longer, she got a wicker basket for him, and she caulked it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child into it and placed it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. And his sister stationed herself at a distance to learn what would befall him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the Nile while her maidens walked along the Nile. She spied the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to go fetch it. When she opened it, she saw it was a child, a boy crying. She took pity on it and said, this must be a Hebrew child. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a Hebrew nurse to suckle the child? And Pharaoh's daughter answered, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will pay your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter who made him her son. She named him Moses, explain him, explaining, I drew him out of the water. Min hamayim mishitihu. Mishitihu Moses. Okay? Now, 
what questions might we have about this text? We all know this story so well, it's almost impossible to question it, right? Because we've heard it so many times that it's like, it's, it's like in well-worn grooves in our brains. What questions might we have about this text? Yeah. How come no one's names except for Moses is are cited in here? Very good. Right. So there's no names. Exactly. There's no names. And the rabbis are going to pick up on that immediately. Yeah. What do you think of Miriam here? I mean, we don't have her name, Miriam, but we know it's Miriam. She's a quick thinker. In what way? How is she a quick thinker? Right. She wants to make sure he's going to be safe. I'm just repeating for the Zoom. Exactly. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat what Stuart said. She is a mighty quick thinker. She's watching to see what's going to happen to her brother. And we're going to talk a little bit in a minute about, we're going to delve deeper into that story. And she sees that Pharaoh's daughter takes him out of the water and she thinks, oh God, what am I going to do now? Hmm. I need to make sure that this child grows up Jewish. He can't grow up Jewish without, uh, he can't grow up Jewish anymore, right? What, what, why, why is he in the water? Let's just make sure we all know that. Why Why they put him in the, in the Nile? Who said that he couldn't, wh why? Pharaoh, right. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, um, has made this decree and edict that all the Jewish baby boys have to be thrown in the river. And the parents think they're going to kill their baby boys. They put him in the basket, right? So she's like, okay, so he can't be raised as a Jew. He's going to be raised in the palace. That's what's going to happen. He's going to be raised in Pharaoh's palace. That's great. He will be safe. He will be sound. He will be protected. But he sure as heck isn't going to be Jewish if he's raised in Pharaoh's home. So what does she do? Stuart's right. She thinks on her feet. She says, do you need a wet nurse? And of course, Pharaoh's daughter needs a wet nurse. She hasn't just had a baby. She doesn't have milk. They didn't have formula back then. So she says, yes, I need a wet nurse. So Miriam just goes and gets Yocheved, gets Moses' mother. And indeed, M Moses gets raised until he's weaned. He's raised by his own mother. Think about what she did. This baby was going to die. This baby was going to be killed by Pharaoh. And she instrumentalized it. So not only is he not killed by Pharaoh, but he gets to say, as a Jewish boy, alive in his parents' home. That's pretty amazing. Okay, so we're gonna deal with the name issue now. There are no names. So why aren't there names? Well, the Bible has all kinds of bizarre uh, uh, times that it uses names, times it doesn't use names. As a woman, I have to tell you, it's very often women that don't have names, something I find very annoying um, and frustrating. So we don't know exactly why there are no names here but there's a lot of name play that we're gonna look at today. So it's good that you asked that question because the rabbis are very keyed into names in this particular section of the Torah, and we're gonna talk a lot about these things. Okay, so let's look at source two. Source two is from the Babylonian Talmud, Masechet Sota, um, page 12a. Now, the rabbis are going to now answer the question about the names. The rabbis are gonna consider like, who are these people? Who are we talking about here? Who is this man? Who is this woman? Okay, so let's read. The verse states, and there went a man of the house of Levi and took for his wife a woman of Levi. The Gemara asks, where did he go? What does that mean? Where did he go? Rabbi Yehuda bar Zavina says, he went according to the advice of his daughter, Miriam. Huh, okay. A sage teaches, Amram, the father of Moses, so they're, they're making Amram into this man, was a great man of his generation. Once he saw that the wicked Pharaoh said, every son who is born to you, you shall cast into the river and every daughter you save alive, he said, we are laboring for nothing by bringing children into the world to be killed. Therefore, he arose and divorced his wife. All others who saw this followed his example and arose and divorced their wives. So let's stop there and unpack for a second. The rabbis are clear that this man is Amram and this woman is his wife, Yochanan. And Amram, who's a leader in the community, says, you can see why. Why should I have children? Why should I have children? Because there's a 50-50 chance that it's going to be a boy. And if it's a boy, then Pharaoh's going to kill the baby. I, I can't have children in that world. It's too hard. It's too painful. And back then, you know, if you were married, you had children. There was no birth control. So he divorced his wife. 
again, remember, is this, did this happen? The rabbis are telling it not for the truth, but for the truth. So we'll talk about the truth in a minute. Okay, continue. His daughter Miriam said to him, Father, your decree is more harsh than the Jew, for the Jewish people than that of Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh decreed only with regard to the males, but you decreed both on the males and the females. And now no children will be born. See what she's saying? You, what you're doing is preventing Jews from having any children. At least let there be girls. At least let there be some children who live. Additionally, Pharaoh decreed to kill them only in this world, but you decreed in the wor this world and the world to come, as those who are not born won't enter the world to come. What, he, what she's saying is, in her religious mind, right? If the baby is killed, the baby will go to heaven. But a baby that's never conceived is not going to the world to come. It's something that never happened. Miriam continued, additionally, concerning Pharaoh the wicked, it is uncertain whether his decree will even be fulfilled. You are a righteous person, and as such, your decrees will certainly be fulfilled. As it is stated with regard to the righteous, you shall also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto you, a quote from Job. Amram accepted his daughter's words and arose and brought back, i.e. remarried his wife, and all the others who saw this followed his example and arose and brought back their wives. It's an amazing story. Now you see why I said that literally Moses wouldn't have existed without Miriam. According to the rabbis, there would have been no Moses. The only reason Moses was born is because Miriam said to the father, Amram, you're an idiot. What are you doing? Make Jewish babies. Have Jewish children. We'll figure it out. Your decree could come true. Why are you listening to Pharaoh? Why are you letting Pharaoh decree our future when you could decree our future? Okay, so what image of Miriam do we have here? Who is she? What, what qualities would you attribute to Miriam here? She, okay, good. She's a prophet. She's a prophet. She is a prophetess. She's one of the, the seven or five, I don't remember now, women prophetesses. We're going to talk about that in a second too. She's very outspoken. She speaks her mind. This is no shrinking wallflower, this girl. She's a, it's a little girl with a big mouth. Yeah. She's incredibly courageous, incredibly brave. This was probably not a time that children uh, were, you know, we're going to see later that the, that the rabbis call her impudent to her father. We're going to see why in a minute. Um, but she, she has, you'll see, she has a little impudence to her. She's like courageous and brave, but even maybe a little cheeky. Okay. Source three. We're going to get now into what Stuart was saying about uh, Miriam being a prophetess. Um, okay. So... Before we do source three, three, I want to take a little side turn to source eight just for a minute. We're actually going to deal with source eight more in depth than it later, but source eight is actually we're going to read in tomorrow's Torah portion. Um, and source three, while it's commenting on Miriam as a little girl, it's riffing on source eight. So we got to bring in source eight first. Okay, so let's look at source eight. Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, picked up a hand drum and all the women went after her in dance with hand drums. And Miriam chanted for them, sing to God for he has triumphed gloriously, horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. What, do you remember what the song is? Who knows what she's, what is she singing about? The Red Sea, right. She's singing about that God just delivered the Jewish people, right? They, they came out of Egypt and then Pharaoh changed his mind pretty darn fast. And they arrive at the Red Sea. Imagine this, they're standing in front of the Red Sea. And there's the water. They can't go anywhere. And behind them, they hear the hoofbeats of Pharaoh's soldiers coming to get them. And they're stuck literally between a rock and a hard place. And then God makes a miracle. You'll read more about it tomorrow. God makes a miracle and the sea splits and the Jewish people are able to come through on dry land. And then the sea goes back and it drowns all the Egyptians. So there's, this is Shabbat Shira, the Shabbat of song. And there are these two songs that we're going to read tomorrow in tomorrow's Torah reading. And this is one of the songs, Miriam's song. Okay, so does anyone see something a little weird? Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister. Well, what's weird about that? Something's really weird. Why does it say Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister? Where's Moses? What do you mean Aaron's sister? Who's Aaron? He's a minor league character. Okay, so now turn back. Now turn back to source three. The, the rabbis saw that and they were troubled by that. So let's see how they explain it. 
Elsewhere, the verse states with regard to Miriam, and Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the hand drum in her hands, and all the women went out and danced. The Gemara says, why is Miriam referred to as the sister of Aaron and not the sister of Moses? Rav Amram says that Rav says, and some say that Rav Nachman says that Rav says, this teaches that Miriam already prophesied when she was still the sister of only Aaron, i.e. before Moses was born. And as a child, Miriam would say, in the future, my mother will give birth to a son who will save the Jewish people. And once Moses was born, the entire house was filled with light. Her father arose and kissed her on the head. He said to her, my daughter, your prophecy has been fulfilled. And once they put him in the river, her father arose and hit her on the head. He said to her, my daughter, where is your prophecy now? And this is why it is written, and his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him, to know what would be the ultimate resolution of her prophecy. Okay, let's unpack. First of all, Poor Amram is not getting, he's not getting a good shake from the rabbis. He's uh, not the greatest of guys, right? He, first of all, gave up and divorced his wife, right? And had to be told by his little daughter, you're not doing the right thing. And now, you know, he, he believes her prophecies when they are happy, when they're good, when they talk about the birth of a child is going to save the Jewish people. But he loses a lot of faith very quickly because this child that's supposed to save the Jewish people all of a sudden now is going to have to be put in the Nile. And he hits her. He hits her. Okay, so let's look what Miriam does. Does Miriam go to her bed and cry? No. Does Miriam say, guess my prophecy must have been wrong? No. She literally goes to the banks of the Nile. Think about the first source, which they quote here, first source that we looked at. She goes to the banks of the Nile and stands there waiting to see what is going to happen to her prophecy? She knows it's going to come true, and she wants to see how. Amram has given up. She knows, knows in her kishkas that this is going to happen. Her brother is going to save the Jewish people. She just has to see how. Now, I want us to take a step back and remember, remember for a second, and a minute ago, we talked about what Stuart said, that Miriam didn't just stand by as a spectator to see what God was going to do. She acted to help God's prophecy come true. She partnered with God. She was God's right-hand woman. God made sure that Moses got saved, but Miriam made sure he got raised by his Jewish mother. Have you ever heard the joke, um, it's a bad, it's not really a joke, like a little parable about the guy who's drowning in the water and he prays to God. Some of you are nodding your heads. You know what I'm talking about? He prays to God and he says, um, God, save me from the water. I can't swim. I'm going to drown. And a few minutes later, a, a fisherman's boat goes by and he says, I'm here to help you. I, I can help you. And he says, no, no, no. I believe in God. I'm praying to God. God's going to save me. A few minutes later, a helicopter comes and drops a ladder down here to save you. No, no, no. God's going to save me. Et cetera, et cetera. You get the picture. So the guy dies and he goes up to heaven and God says, to, he says to God, why didn't you save me? I was a loyal servant of God my whole life. I prayed to you. Why didn't you save me? And God said, what did you want? I sent you a helicopter. I sent you a boat. What, what, I did all the things. So Miriam would never have been that guy, right? Because Miriam sees the opportunity. She sees what God is offering, and she says, here's what I can do to help. Here's how I can partner with you to bring about the vision that you want, the vision that you shared with me. What was God's vision? Remember what Miriam's prophecy was. Miriam's prophecy was, my mother's going to give birth to a child who's going to save the whole Jewish people. And here we have this moment where Miriam is the one, God saves the child's life, but Miriam is the one who ensures that Moses can grow up to be the person who can save the Jewish people. He's not going to just grow up to be some Egyptian. Incredible. Okay, we're going to do a little more name changing, name playing. Look at source four. This is also from the first chapter, the first uh, Parsha in the book of Exodus from Parsha Shmot. So we're going back a little bit um, and we're going to do some more name play. Okay, so 
This is when the king issues his declaration about the baby boys. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. One of them is named Shifra, and the other one was named Pua, saying, when you deliver the Hebrew women, look at the birth stool. If it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, fearing God, fearing God, did not do as the king of Egypt told them. They let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing, letting the boys live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They're vigorous. Before the midwife can come to them, they've given birth. And God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and increased greatly, and God established households for the midwives because they feared God. Okay, so these midwives are also not exactly rule followers, a little cheeky, impudent, brave, courageous, right? What, are, what do you think the rabbis are going to do with them? Who are these women going to be made into? Yocheved and Miriam. Okay, so let's take a look at the next source, and then we're going to unpack this biblical text with the rabbis together. This is also from Sota, from the, the Talmud in um, Masechet Sota. It's taught in a Brita. They were a woman and her daughter. Who were Shifra and Pua? They were a woman and her daughter. With regard to Shifra, who is referred to in the verse, this is really a reference to Yocheved. And why was she called Shifra? Because she would prepare Misha Peret, there's a little word play going on, the newborn. Alternatively, she is referred to as Shifra because the Jewish people increased and multiplied. Shiparu virabu. They're playing with the Hebrew root from Shifra. In her days, due to her assistance. The Brita continued. With regard to Pua, who is referred to in the verse, this is really a reference to Miriam. So why was she called Pua? Because she would make a comforting sound. Poo, poo as she would remove the child from the warmth of the mother. Alternatively, the word pua is related to one of the verbs that describes speaking, as she would speak, poa, through divine inspiration, and say, in the future, my mother will give birth to a son who will save the Jewish people. Amazing, right? Here we have these women who are midwives, Shifra and Pua, who have names, right? These odd women who actually have names in the Torah. And, um, and the rabbis make them into... Yochavet and Miriam. Why do you think the rabbis did that? What big message might they be trying to portray here? What are they linking? No answers are the wrong answers because there is no right answer. It's just what you think. I mean, I can tell you what I think. I think that they're making this connection between Shifra and Pura and Yochavet and Miriam because they're trying to teach a lesson to the Jewish people through this character, of Miriam. Miriam is a very important character to the rabbis. They have lessons to teach the Jewish people, and they want Pua included in this message. They want to make the story of Pua part of the story of Miriam. So I think, I think that that's what was going on there. Okay. Um, next source, source six, Shmot Rab. So Shmot Rabbah is a, 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 a compilation of um, rabbinic kind of uh, stories from the from the Torah, where they uh, rabbinic exegesis about the Torah, where they are going to tell stories to fill in the text, kind of what what, we, what we've been doing so far. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew mid midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other one was Pua, who were the midwives? Rabbi Shmuel and Nachman says a woman and her daughter Yochavad. Now they're going to tell another story. Miriam was no more than five years old as Aaron was three years older than Moses. Our rabbis of blessed memory said she would go with her mother Yocheved and assist her, and she was very quick. While the child is too, still young, his character is recognizable. That is why Solomon said, even a lad is recognized through his deeds. See, they're, they're priming us to think about Miriam as this person who even at the age of five, she was, she was a specific kind of person. Alternatively, Pua, because she was impudent. Remember I said before they were going to say she was impudent? Hophia Panim to, per, to Pharaoh, and she had her nose in the air toward him, and she said to him, woe unto that man when God will come and punish you. He became filled with fury and sought to kill her. Shifra, because she eased Mishaparet, the words of her daughter, and placated him toward her. She said to him, are you paying attention to her? She's a child, and she knows nothing. Do you think Miriam, that Yocheved really thought Miriam knew nothing? No, <laughs> she, she got it. Alternatively, that is Pua, who was impudent toward her father. Okay, so what qualities does Pua slash Miriam have now? Similar to before. We're just building on it. 
Thank you. That's a great word. She has chutzpah in the best of ways. She is super chutzpahdik. Not chutzpahdik in the way we didn't want our children to be chutzpahdik when they were growing up. Chutzpahdik in the way that she, as you know, as the, the social justice warriors would say, she speaks truth to power, right? That's exactly what she does. She speaks truth to power, whether power is her father or whether power is Pharaoh. She has a vision of the world that God has given her and gosh darn it, she is going to bring that vision around and she is not going to be shy about it. So chutzpah is a great word. Okay, Rashi on Exodus, he made them houses. So I don't know if you, if you noticed when we were reading that text, text number four, at the end of the story of the midwives, it says in verse 21, God established households for the midwives because they feared God. I never read it. We're like, what does that mean? God established households for them. What does that mean? It's such a weird statement. So whenever we have weird statements in the text, we go to Rashi. And here we go. What did Rashi say? He made them houses. Houses are dynasties. Dynasties of the priesthood and the Levites and of royalty, which are all termed batim, houses. And they give a quote from Kings. Um, a dynasty of priests and Levites from Yocheved, Shifra, and the house of the king, a royal dynasty from Miriam, Pua. So what does that mean? Why dynasties? Well, first of all, anyone here a Levi or a Kohen? A few of you. Okay. So you are descendants, you Levi's and Levi's and Kohen, Kohanim, Levi'im and Kohanim, are descendants of Aaron, right? So it's a very special sector of the Jewish community. And this text is saying that the fact that this group became this dynasty, this dynasty that is so important to the Jewish people, was because of Miriam and Yochebed. Let's make the link there. Why? Miriam, Yochebed, slash Shifrapua. What did they do that would warrant God making dynasties for them. What did they do? Think about their role as midwives. What is so special? Why would God reward them with a dynasty that represents generations and generations and generations of the Jewish people? I see some of you nodding. Yes? Yeah. I mean, in a way, they made dynasties, right? They made the dynasty of the Jewish people. And God rewarded them with what they did. God rewarded them because they did exactly what God was giving them dynasties. Without them, would there have been any dynasties to build? Okay. We're almost done. Back to source eight, which we're going to read tomorrow. Again, Miriam the prophetess, her brother Aaron goes out. We talked about why only Aaron. It's because it was before Moses was born that Miriam became a prophetess. But there's another question that arises from this text. Timbrels? Hand drums? I mean, I want you to imagine for a moment that you are escaping from Egypt, running for your life, and Pharaoh is going to chase you. Maybe you don't realize that immediately. Do you pack your hand drum? No. Nope. No hand drum. You pack food, you pack clothing, maybe some animals if you can, and you run for your life. And yet Miriam had a hand drum ready to go. A hand drum on the banks of the of the of the Red Sea of the Red Sea. How did she have that? Let's look at Rashi, source nine. The righteous women in that generation were confident that God would perform miracles for them. And they accordingly brought timbrels with them from Egypt. This is Miriam, right? This is who she is. I'm gonna stand by the shores of the Nile because I'm confident that God is going to bring about my prophecy and I'm gonna be there to see it and be there to help him. And now I'm leaving Egypt and I am confident that I'm actually going to be redeemed that I'm going to make it to the other side. And because I'm confident, I'm going to partner with God again, this time to celebrate God when I get to the other side. This is 
her personality kind of being traced through these texts. I always think that it's just amazing to think that she had the wherewithal to think to pack a drum and also that she was so confident. Remember, when you think about the Jews, you'll read tomorrow in your Torah reading, the Jews, what do they know from God? They don't know from God. They don't know from Moses. Who is this Moses? Should they trust him? There's a land of Israel somewhere? I never heard of a land of Israel. We have to walk across the desert to get there? Is this really gonna work? Imagine the fear the complete unknown they were walking into. And she says, I believe. And not only do I believe, but I'm going to make sure that I'm partnering with God to make sure it happens. So how, let's now just leave how the talk a little bit at the end about how the rabbi sort of categorized Miriam. Um, so the first text is actually not a rabbinic text. It's from the Bible, from the prophet Micha, Micah. And he writes, in fact... I brought from you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. In that verse, we see that Miriam is with the big boys, right? She is part of, part and parcel of what we always think was Moses and his sidekick Aaron. But according to Micha, according to this text, it's not Moses and his sidekick Aaron. It's Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Last source, Devarim Rabbah. That's, again, another one of these collections of rabbinic uh, um, um, interpretations of the text. And this one is on the book of Devarim, on the book of Deuteronomy. The sages taught us thus. One who reads from the Torah must not read fewer than three verses. If any of you ever go to synagogue on a weekday or in the afternoon on Shabbat, you, you see the Torah reading is very short. It's not like on Shabbat. So the, the, the shortest verse, the shortest aliyah of the Torah is three verses. So the rabbis are now going to tell us why. Why three? On what basis did our, our sages teach this? Because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Another view, because of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, through whom the Torah was given. That's an amazing statement. Through whom the Torah was given. So I want to just close by saying, what do I mean? What, is, what, what, do I, what do the rabbis mean when they say through whom the Torah was given? I think that what the rabbis are doing there is saying that the Torah is a Torah of activism. Of, it, it's a live Torah. It's a Torah that we don't just accept sitting down and leave it there and not do anything with it. The Torah is something that we get from God, and we have to then partner with God to make it happen to make the social justice world that we see in it make it happen, to make Judaism continue to make that happen, to make Israel remain the state of the Jewish people, the land of the Jewish people. I don't think they anticipated the state of the Jewish people that quite the way we see it today, but the land of the Jewish people, to make it happen. And you see that Miriam is this kind of quiet in terms of the text character. She doesn't get big headlines in Shmod in the book of Exodus. She's not talked about all the time. Sometimes she doesn't have a name. Sometimes she's given a name, Bua, instead of Miriam. But the rabbis have a message to us. And the message is, be like Miriam. You know, like uh, uh, some Christian evangelicals wear those bracelets, like, what would Jesus do? What would Miriam do? What would Miriam do in our moment when we are struggling, when in many ways, and I was talking to my husband about this week's Parsha, and he said, this week's Parsha feels like where we are now. The sea is in front of us. We don't know where to go. The, the, the enemy is marauding behind us. And we're standing on this little patch of land and we're thinking, what are we supposed to do now? What are we supposed to do? And it's WWMD. What would Miriam do? Miriam would believe in our redemption. She would believe in a future that was to come. She would believe that God will save us. She, will believe, she would believe that Israel will be okay. She would believe that the Jewish people in America would be okay, and then she would not sit back and wait for it to happen. She would roll up her sleeves and help God make it happen herself. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>
And it doesn't have to be about Miriam. It could be about anti-Semitism, about what I said at the end, too. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, yes. So she does get herself into trouble. Um, well, she does a few things. She, she, she gets herself into trouble for speaking badly about Moses and his wife. Um, she speaks Lashon Hara, evil tongue, and she gets in trouble um, for that. She also provides the children of Israel with water. Um, and in fact, the Torah says when she died, the water, they didn't have water anymore. I actually like that she did that wrong thing, that sin. Um, I was listening to, I don't know how many of you ever listened to um, uh, the Hartman, Shalom Hartman Institute podcast. They're very good. I highly recommend them. And one of the podcasts uh, is called um, Identity Crisis. It's Yehuda Kurtzer's podcast, my neighbor and friend. Oh, yes, he's amazing. Absolutely. So Yehuda interviewed Daniel Hartman this week. Um, and he was talking about Genesis Jews and Exodus Jews. And I won't get into that because there's nothing to do with what we're talking about, except to say one of the things that Daniel Hartman was saying is that the great thing about the characters that are our leaders in the Bible are that they're so flawed. They're so flawed. Because if you have perfect pictures of leaders in front of you, we can't imagine being those people. None of us is perfect. We're all so flawed. I mean, maybe you're not, but I'm incredibly flawed. So if if we, I, I, that's why I kind of like the, the image of Miriam, like making a mistake. Okay, like she she did enough by that point. She did enough right. I like that Miriam makes a mistake. I like that the images that we have for our leaders are, are flawed images. I think it helps us think about what kind of leaders we could be even as, as we are flawed. Yeah. Yesterday. She set the, the precedent for Zalafkat's daughters 38 years later. You're speaking my language. They're my other favorite women. <laughs> and I tell my bat mitzvah students that I never met a woman. I, th I, I love that you said that. So, so what's your name? Warren. So um, Warren is talking about the daughters of Zalafkat. You'll meet them sometime in the summer. They're in the book of Numbers and again in the book of Deuteronomy. And they are very, very similar to Miriam, very similar. Women have this role in the Bible. The women are the believers when the men are naysayers and doubters and they're not really on board. And the women kind of see the future, that they, that they, they believe in God, and then they bring about the future. So just to capitalize on what you're saying, the daughters of Tzalifka, they're wandering in the desert. And remember, I don't know if you remember this, but the, the Jews in the desert, they're complaining and fetching and whining. They, uh, they say, we don't have water, we don't have this, we don't have that, we want to go back to Egypt. Take us back to Egypt. It's a slave mindset, it's a slave mentality. And the doors of Tzlovchad, as they're all whining, the doors of Tzlovchad's father dies, and he leaves no sons. Now, they're in the desert, they're not in Israel. And they're worried about the inheritance of their father's piece of land in Israel. So they go to Moses and they say, um, our father died, and we don't want him to lose his inheritance. We're women, but we think that we should inherit the land. Kind of the first feminists, if you will. And Moses agrees. First, Moses goes to God. Moses doesn't know what to do. So it says, uh, Moses goes to God, and God says, Cain benot tzlovchad dovrot. The daughters of tzlovchad spoke correctly. Natonti ten lahem. Give them their nachala. Give them their piece of land in, the, in Israel. And it's, exact, it's such a Miriam moment. It's exactly like Miriam, right? It's exactly the same thing. Because here are these women that are in this terrible place. They've been told by God, you're going to make it to the promised land. They've been told by Moses, you're going to make it to the promised land. Everyone else is fetching and saying, we're never going to make it to the promised land. We don't even think there is a promised land. We want to go back to Egypt. And they're saying, not only do we believe there's a promised land while we stand here in the middle of the desert, but we want to make sure that we are living what God wants us to do by inhabiting our father's piece of land when we get there. It's a very, very merry moment. Great connection. I always wanted to have a daughter that I named Noah for the old, for the daughter of Tzlovchad named Noah. But I have, I had one daughter and my husband dreamt her name and it was a whole thing. So we gave her the name that he dreamt, which is a beautiful name, Ateret. And then I had three sons. So I always say to my kids, give me a granddaughter named Noah one day. I love those daughters of Slow Fun. Hmm. Okay, I'll answer that question. My children's names are Ateret, 
Yaniv, Elina Dav, and Neri. So they all have a lot of meaning behind them. A teret's name means a, a very intense prayer. And it comes from the Bible when um, Yitzchak and Rivka and Isaac and Rebecca were praying for a child. It's a very intense prayer. And there's a whole story behind that. And then my son's name is Yaniv, which means he will flourish. I think that was a good name to give a kid. And uh, he's living up to it. So that's good. He's a puppeteer. Um, and then my next son is named Eli Nadav, which means my God is generous. And that name was an aspirational name because he was born in the middle of the Second Intifada in Jerusalem right after 9-11 when my father was diagnosed with brain cancer. So he was born in a very hard moment, very, very hard moment. So we thought naming him My God is Generous would be a good a good name to give him. And he has lived up to that too. And my youngest child's name is Neri, which means my candle. And um, he was named Neri because my father's name was Henry. So we kind of took the Neri from Henry and we made Neri. Um, everyone always asks if he was born on Hanukkah, but he was actually born on Yom Ma'ut. Yeah. That's a great question. So I'm just going to repeat it for the Zoom. Um, how are women impacting the future in particular ways in Israel? So not only today, but I would say even going back <clears throat> generations, women have played a specific and very special role in impacting Israel. Um, I mean, Israel had a woman prime minister. We still haven't had a woman prime minister. We'll get there someday, uh, maybe. Um, but leaving her aside, there were a group of mothers when the Lebanon war was dragging on and on and on in the 1980s. There was a group of mothers, I think it was called the Four Mothers, in fact, if I'm remembering correctly, um, who got together to protest that war and to try to push America to, uh, Israel to withdraw from Lebanon, that these, their sons were dying and that there was really not enough of a purpose for them to be there. And they were successful in the end. They were, they were successful in, in being able to get Israel to, to leave Gaza. Um, in terms of the women you're talking about in the Negev, they're sort of, um, they're women who um, create bonds with across dif dialogues across difference. So mothers of Palestinians, mothers of Bedouin, mothers of Israeli Arabs, mothers of Jewish Israelis coming together to talk across difference. And I think there's something powerful about that um, notion of change making because Every mother worries deeply about her children. Fathers worry deeply about their children too, of course. But maybe there's something, you know, I, I have a friend, a dear friend in Riverdale who always says that it's it's cellular for mothers, maybe. Um, because literally, our, our, when you're pregnant, apparently the cells of your baby stay inside of your bloodstream forever. It's kind of crazy. Um, so there's something that's powerful about women working for change because they have this sense of, their children being the ones who are going to pay the price of war. And there were many, many women in the Gaza envelope who were very involved with a lot of these, this peace work, who were murdered or taken hostage on October 7th. And if you think about the irony, the cruelty of that, it's so unbelievable that women who were making um, connections with other women across these boundaries. And we're going to talk a lot this weekend, I hope, about dialogue across difference and about um, about speech, um, something I'm going to talk about tonight, both talks that I'm going to give tonight um, in different ways, that women who are so engrossed in that work would have been attacked and murdered on that day is like the cruelest of the cruel. So thank you for raising that. It's a, it's a very important issue. The, or the, the movements of Orthodox women to make change in the Orthodox community in America and in Israel is also a very, very powerful story that I've been very a, much a part of myself um, in, in creating women rabbis for the Orthodox community um, in creating um, 
an organization that I helped to found that um, it's called the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance that tried to tries to um, elevate the place of, or, of women in the Orthodox community. So thank you for that question. Love that. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it's on, it's, you're, yes. Right. No, I'm actually, um, I'm not doing that in one of my pieces, but maybe I should have, because <laughs> I talk about that all the time. Um, yes, we can trace the beginnings of anti-Semitism. Um, scholars believe that anti-Semitism stems from early Christianity. Um, when the Christian church was beginning, the Catholic church, like the very early years of the of, of CE, um, you know, Christianity, Jesus was not Christian. He never thought of himself as Christian. He was Jewish. He was born a Jew. He died a Jew. He had no idea there was something called Christianity. But his descendants did. So in the 300s, let's say the 200s and 300s, as Christianity is starting to become more of a thing, Christian leaders had a vested interest in something called supersessionism. Supersessionism is that Christianity is superseding Judaism. Christianity and Judaism are very much in uh, conflict with one another at this moment. It's hard to imagine now that there are, I think, 2 billion Christians in the world and 15.7 million Jews. So I, I think they, they won that battle um, in some ways. Um, but it was in their interest to paint Jews as dangerous murderers of God, right? Deicide. They killed Jesus, something the church no longer believes but did at the time and that they were um, disloyal, that they were um, conniving, all the things that went into this deicide charge. You can see that the church had a real interest in saying that the Jews were past. God doesn't want the Jews anymore. And in fact, the Jews are dangerous. And in fact, we have to keep them around so we can look at how benighted they are and how um, pathetic they are so that we know that we succeeded. And that was the roots of it those roots then developed in many, many ways in medieval times, um, in early modern times, um, into all kinds of different tropes that are still baked into our society. We'll find some time over the weekend to talk about this because this is my, uh, my bread and butter. I talk about this all the time. Um, and uh, that's where it started. Thank you. Thank you so much.